Amen. Let's pray. Father, we adore you. We lay our lives before you. And we love you. Lord, we thank you for today. I thank you, Lord, for your goodness. I thank you, Lord, for your mercy. I thank you, Lord, for answering prayer. I thank you, Lord, that sometimes, many times we think about things, don't even pray about it, don't even feel worthy to pray for something. But then you answer anyway. So, Lord, continue to answer prayers in our lives. Those that we pray audibly, those that we think in our mind and those that we were even too ashamed to ask for. But Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you give us the courage that we need to go to you for all the things, to go to you for all of our situations, to go to you for all of our desires that are consistent with yours. And we pray that you continue to answer our prayers. We pray, Lord, for the president and his wife, first lady, we pray that they can recover, that they will recover from the COVID-19 situation as well as all the other affected federal officials, senators, and staff of the president and the White House. Pray that they get all the care that they need, all the medication they need, and the doctors do a good job in monitoring the situation. And Lord, we also pray, Lord, for those that are afflicted in this country of the COVID situation, Lord. Lord, continue to give them wisdom and continue to give them the best medical care that their situation needs and their situation calls for. Pray these things in your son's precious name. Amen. All right. Amen. Good to see you this week. The word for today uh, is not the sermon. The word for today is found in Romans chapter 11, verse 29. Romans chapter 11, verse 29. And that reads, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So if God calls you, it's not going to take it back. Keep moving forward in your gift. Keep moving forward in your calling. Well, in terms of announcements, what I can say is, you know, the stuff that we've ordered and some of the stuff that we uh, have put into place is finally starting to come in. As you can see, we do have our banner. We have the uh, podium. You can't see that in front of me. Uh, there's some other things that are in order, some things that are on the way. Um, so you know, thank God making progress already. The goal, of course, is to have a brick and mortar in an actual church in Far Rockaway in September 2021. Um, hopefully you could join us in that journey. In terms of offering, again, uh, we're going to have to probably, we're going to have to defer offering until the fourth Sunday, until the fourth service. Uh, so uh, when we post our philosophy of giving, which will be between the third and the fourth service, for third and fourth Sunday, take a look at it. If you agree with that, Feel free to give and be a part of this ministry. Um, I don't have anything in terms of the pastor's word, but I do have a preview of the sermon. Just going to get right into the word. Don't waste a lot of time. So, uh, of course, we're going to talk again about John, verse 1633. That's the one we read the last time. Um, but I, I have a few thoughts about, I also had a few thoughts about a, a couple of things. So, Remember the story of Moses and the burning bush. So Moses was, uh, he was Hebrew. He was in uh, Egypt at the time Egypt had slavery. His mother and sister miraculously got him out of that situation. He ended up being raised in Pharaoh's household as, as one of the children of the most powerful man of that era in that part of the world. So he was uh, born a slave, grew up in royalty, There's some tension in him in terms of who do I identify with you know he killed a guy then he was uh, chased out of Egypt ended up in a place called Midian when he went to Midian the family that he uh, ran into they embraced him ended up getting married had a child new job new career everything was new for him all the stuff that he all the turmoil all the tension that he had while in Egypt that's gone done with that I got a new life new wife new kid everything's good doing well financially and of course, he's walking, he sees this tree, this bush that's burning, but it's not being consumed. He goes to see it, goes up to the mountain area, goes up to the burning bush, sees the situation for himself, and then he hears from God. First time in his life, 
Don't even know what his relationship with God was up to that point. But God himself speaks to Moses through that burning bush, tells him a number of things. He tells him he has to go back, go back to Egypt and bring my people out. I've seen their suffering. You've seen that, you've heard that, you've seen the movie, you've read it in a book, you've read it in the Bible. But then there's this thing that happens. So Moses says, who do I say is sending me? Saying to God, what, what, what do you call yourself? What's your name? Who do I say? What name do I go into to do this great task that you've given me? And the answer is the thing that frustrates me. He says, I am. I am that I am. Doesn't, you know, which is, if you, in the Hebrew, it's like a, an unpronounceable word, Y-H-W-H, something along those lines. A word that, you know, that's not, not even pronounceable. It doesn't really define him. And for years that frustrated me. I mean, why doesn't God just have a name? Why didn't he just give him a name? Other religions, they could give their God's name or they draw him on the board, draw him on the wall. And I realize, I don't recall who, who taught it, is that God is so infinite and God has so many aspects of his divinity that he can't confine himself to one name and one description. You know, Jehovah Jireh, he's our provider. Jehovah Sikhanu, he's our banner. God is our protector. You know, God is so many things to us. He is what he needs to be. He is what we need him to be for a particular situation. If you need protection from God, you get that. If you need financial blessings from God, you get that. So he is so many things, and he is what we need for that situation. So, so today, we're going to be talking about to a certain extent, we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit, right? And there's so many, because the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity, and the Holy Spirit has so many jobs, so many things that he does on our behalf as we need it. Now, I'm not even, you know, it's, it's really kind of impossible to talk about all of them in this sermon, but we're going to talk about one aspect of the Holy Spirit. He's called the Spirit of Truth that shows us things to come. So that's going to be our working definition for the Holy Spirit today, the spirit of truth that shows us things to come. He's the comforter, he's this, that, and the other. But for today's message, we're going to focus on that aspect of the Holy Spirit. So let's go to the word right now. Uh, it's basically the same from last week, just a different part of it. That's John 16, verse 33. And please stand for the reading of God's word if you can. If you're not able to, I understand. But if you can, please stand for God for the reading of God's word. And when, when I'm done, you can have a seat. John 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me, that in me, ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Lord, speak to us today. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. So there's this thing that people are talking about out there in the community, scientific community, it's called AI. You know, if you ever watched a you know, television, television commercial, you know, there's so many different companies that are promoting their version of their brand of AI. AI is artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence. This one has it, this one has it, this says it's gonna make your product better, it's gonna make our company better, but what is AI? AI is really just a computer tool that allows people to make more efficient decisions about stuff. And I think the best way to explain it is the situation that I had. Um, one day I had, to, I had to travel from, I was from New York to a place called Owensboro, Kentucky. So went through a, different, a lot of different ways. How do we drive, do we fly? Usually when I travel, I travel with my investigator. So, you know, trying to figure out the best, most efficient way to do it, driving, flying, taking a train, taking a bus. It turns out the best way to do it would be for me to fly into Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky, and then rent a car and then drive from Louisville to Owensboro. So if you guys want to follow along, take out your phone or your device or go on your laptop and type in distance between Owensboro, Kentucky and Louisville, Kentucky. See what you find. Just go look it up. Go quick. I'll wait. Distance between Owensboro, Kentucky, 
and Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville's been in the news a lot lately, obviously. But that's not what I'm talking about. Just the distance between Louisville, Kentucky, and Owensboro, Kentucky. Now, if you do that, you can see that the drive is a bit over 100 miles, and it takes about a little under two hours to get there. And as you can see, Owensboro is west of Louisville. So the goal was to drive, you know, take, fly into Louisville Airport, rent a car, there's a million rent a car companies there, then drive from Louisville to Owensboro and repeat it going back. Drive from Owensboro to Louisville, take the flight home. So, you know, just get a GPS. I mean, I'm not from there. Um, don't know my way around necessarily. So I got a car with GPS, paid a lecture for that. So I typed in the address, the hotel where I was going, get in the car and I'm driving. Now you can see Owensboro's west of Louisville. I noticed the car, the GPS was taking me east. Now if you look at the map also, Lexington, Kentucky is east of Louisville. That's a big basketball town, Lexington, as is Louisville. So I'm like, why am I going to Lexington? I should be going west. So I thought maybe there was some kind of you know, some kind of path, some kind of road, or some kind of way to do a workaround. I'm driving for like half an hour, I'm still going east. So I, I pull over, I call the hotel, and I ask them, you know, how do I get there? They told me, I said, you west of, of Louisville? I said, yeah, of course. I said, well, I put your information in the GPS. How come it didn't show up? Oh yeah, well, this is a brand new hotel. Hotel is less than three months old. And he said, we're probably not in the system yet. That's why the, the GPS couldn't find us. So GPS, what it does is it mapped out the quick, what it should have done is map out the quickest way for me to get from Louisville Airport to the hotel in, in Oldsburg, Kentucky. It looks at the roads, the traffic patterns, construction sites, and it gives you step by step how to get from where you are to where you need to be. The problem with AI, the one problem with it is, there's a couple, but the main problem with AI is that the information that the computer relies on has to be accurate. It has to be the most updated information in order for the computer, the AI part of it to help you get from one to the next. You know that little voice, press it, turn right, turn, that's AI. That's, you've been using AI probably for 10 years now, don't even know it. That's artificial intelligence, how to, make better, more efficient decisions. But the limit is, it's not based, if you don't have the most updated information, you could get lost. You just, it replicates error, and you could end up, like me, heading to Lexington instead of Owensboro. So, with that in mind, let's, let's look at the text. I'll read it again. John 16, 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Last week we talked about being of good cheer and overcoming the world. Now we're going to talk about peace. That in me you might have peace. Now peace, the Greek word for peace, means prosperity, quietness, rest uh, just in terms of prosperity prosperity that's again that's another subject for another day prosperity means financial you're able to financially support yourself your family live debt free and also you'll have all the finances you need to do whatever god has called you to do remember 11 29 god's gifted and calling so whatever it is god has called you to do you're going to have the finances that are such prosperity to complete it so peace means peace prosperity quietness and quietness and rest and the word tribulation in the world you shall have tribulation tribulation the greek word for that means afflicted to rub a worn out path a wound and the word i'm going to use because there's an actual greek word to describe tribulation i think we all know is called trauma Trauma. Tribulation means trauma. Right? Peace means regular peace, prosperity, quietness, and rest. Now, 
again, last week we talked about how the words of Jesus give us courage. And the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, the fact that he overcame and conquered the world should also give us courage. But now we're going to talk about something else. We're going to talk about the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, and what that means and what that could mean for us in terms of this verse. So I have one other verse to talk about. Now remember, last week, this is the, the, uh, the Last Supper. In chapter 13, Jesus had to take care of some business. He got Judas out of the room. He had to tell Peter, he had to put Peter in his place because Peter was really overzealous. He did, you know, the foot washing, which showed them that even though he was their master, that he could serve, right? So servant leadership is very important. He actually washed their feet. They had the meal, the communion meal, breaking of bread, this is my body, the wine, this is my blood. That's the first, really, the right, the first Christian right was, the, was right there in terms of communion. So all that's done, 13's done. And 14, 15, 16, right, he's talking about, and 17, these are the words of Jesus, things that he's telling them. And these are the words that we could use to get courage as long as, long as well, as well as the resurrection. So I'm just going to read to you one of those words. We read about five last week. Uh, we're going to read just one now. And that's John chapter 16, verses 12 and 13. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. Okay, so what are you talking about it? What do you, what do you mean in terms of showing you all truth? So even though you suffer trauma, the spirit of truth will give you peace, rest, and prosperity. Now, there's a couple of examples of that in the scripture. I remember Noah. Noah was, was described as a man who had favor with God. But Noah found favor with God. And he was diligent in terms of how he interacted with God. So God came to him and told him something. And what he told them was, it was he told them about the world, what was going to happen, it was going to rain, it was going to flood, and the whole world is going to be wiped out. I'm going to start again with you. So Noah, right, was guided by the Spirit of God, by the Spirit of Truth, to talk about things to come, things yet to come, things that are happening, things that will happen. And he aligned himself with the Word of God and the will of God took him almost about a hundred years or so to build that ark. So he, his wife, his children, all got into the ark along with the animals at the appointed time and they were saved. What the spirit of truth does when he gives you instructions for life is done in such a way not only will the kingdom be advanced, but it'll take care of you and your family. So the spirit of truth if we align ourselves with the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit, it could show you things to come. And of course, you also remember Joseph. You know, Joseph was uh, the son of, of, uh, of Jacob, one of 12 sons. His uh, brothers didn't like him. He was sold into slavery, ended up in Egypt. Ended up doing, ended up, you know, not only a slave, ended up in prison. Just really was, you know, very, very difficult life up to that point. But the people that he, one of the, the persons he was in, in prison with knew that he could interpret dreams because he interpreted two dreams given to him while he was in prison. One of the persons who had his dream interpreted ended up working for Pharaoh. Pharaoh ended up having a dream, didn't know the answer to it. So the guy says, wow, I remember when I was in prison, this young Hebrew interpreted my dreams for me. Maybe this man could help you. So Joseph gets into the presence of Pharaoh. He's told what Pharaoh's dream is, and he interprets it right away. He says there will be seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. In the seven years of plenty, 
and these are the jo and this is Joseph's instruction to Pharaoh, set aside some of that food, set aside some of the surplus in that time of plenty, so that when the drought comes, you'll be okay. So God used at show Joseph a vision, a glimpse of the future. And because he was able to communicate that with Pharaoh, not only was Joseph promoted, he was able to bring his family uh, from Israel to Egypt so that when the drought really hit, his family wasn't affected. He wasn't affected. He ended up starting a new life, got a new family and everything like that. And the nation that he prayed about, that he worked for, was blessed. So God does have the ability through the Holy Spirit to show us things to come. And when he shows us things to come, it's not like, you know, the Holy Spirit is not AI. There's no data problems because God knows everything, sees everything, is everywhere. All the information that he has and giving you that proclamation and giving you that information is something that's right on point and right on time. And that's helpful, not only for his kingdom, of course, it's all about his kingdom, but it's also helpful for you in particular, as well as your family. He took care of Noah personally and his family. He took care of Joseph personally, as well as his, as his family and the nation in which he was serving under, was also saved. Now, getting back to, to John 33, John 16, 33. Let's, let's talk about Peter for a minute. Now, Peter was in the room. He was in the room. He, didn't, he, he wasn't sent out the room by, by Jesus like Judas was. But Peter had some issues. It took him a while. I mean, these... He said these things, 14, 15, 16. He had lived with Jesus for three years. But it took a while for all of this stuff to, to take hold. Peter was, was a flawed man. I mean, first, when they came for Jesus, he's actually a violent man. He used violence to try to stop this man from taking Jesus. Then he was an afraid man because after they took Jesus, he and all the other disciples ran away. So... He, he operated sometimes in unnecessary violence. He dealt with the issue of fear. And remember when Jesus was being put on trial and a woman came up to him and says, hey, weren't you, weren't you one of the guys with Jesus all, these, all this time? No, 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 no. So he distanced himself. And it was, this is three times that it happened. He disassociated himself from his relationship with Jesus. So he had, this is all from the time that he was in the room until the day of Pentecost, which, which we're going to talk about. He was afraid. He ran away. He disassociated himself with Jesus. He was violent. And also remember, when Jesus was, was killed and before he rose from the dead, the disciples were together. And then Peter says, hey, you know, I'm going fishing. I'm going fishing. It may have been before the resurrection, maybe shortly after. But he said, I'm going fishing. So he became like disillusioned. He's like, well, you know, I don't know. What, what is this all about? Maybe I just wasted my time. So he, he was fearful twice. He was violent. And he became sort of nonchalant, didn't know what to do. And then he sees, when he's fishing, he sees Jesus on the shore. This is after the resurrection, cooking a meal. And then everybody's rowing back with Peter, you know, being a zealous guy, he jumps in the water and swims back. He's still that zealous guy. And then he has the conversation again, and the Lord restores him. So Peter goes through this whole big transformation. So even though he stayed in the room, even though he was listening to the words of Christ, even though he swore allegiance to Christ at that time, you know, life punched him in the face. You know, Michael, Mike Tyson says, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. He got punched in the face and he, he messed up, messed up several times. But what happened? When he received the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, everything changed. Everything changed. 
He preached that day and 5,000 men got saved. Right? It was also probably women and children that got saved. He preached after the Holy Spirit fell. He was the first one to stand up and preach. When he was walking with John, there's a beggar by, by the temple. The guy says, you know, the guy's asking for money. Peter reaches down, picks him up, and heals him instantly. Peter had so much anointing. People who had sick relatives and sick friends would put them in the path of Peter so that Peter's shadow could pass over them and they could be healed. Peter was given visions from God to go to a, a, a Roman, right? He preached to that whole household. They all got saved. They all got baptized. They all got filled with the Holy Spirit. This is Peter now. This is Peter. And lastly, well, he had boldness, right? He was the one who God used to give and to, to exercise miracles over other people, right? And he associated himself with Christ. Remember when he was arrested for preaching Jesus. That's the only reason he was arrested. They call it, I mean, the Romans thought it was a sedition trying to rile things up, mess things around, mess up our order. We already killed that guy. We don't, we don't need you talking about a dead guy. This is what their mentality, the Romans' mentality was. So they put him in prison. He was flogged, and he was ordered not to teach and preach in the name of Jesus anymore. He says, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do it. I will continue to preach the name of the Lord Jesus. So he was no longer running away from his connection. No longer weren't running away from his commitment to God. No longer being ashamed for the fact that God had saved him and set him apart and spoken words to him. And lastly, about Peter. Now, Peter again was arrested. They kept arresting him. And this time he was on pretty much death row. He's about to be executed. Now, he's sitting in the jail. He was chained on a right hand and a left hand. By, he was chained to a Roman on the left, chained to a Roman guard on the right so that he couldn't get away. And there he was, sleeping. Then the angel came in, let him out miraculously. Then he went back to his people. So Peter was bold. Peter always acknowledged his relationship to Christ, never denied that anymore. Peter was the conduit by which God used him to, to do miracles on other people. And Peter also received miracles when the Lord miraculously set him, got him released from that prison situation. But, one of the, but think about that situation for a minute. Do you remember when Jesus was on a boat and they were on the sea and the seas were very rough and the disciples were, you know, a lot of them were fishermen and trying to get the boat right. And what was Jesus doing? He was sleeping. He was sleeping. You know, the, the road, the, the waves were so rough, they thought they were going to die. But here is Jesus, their master, just sleeping. Right? Then they wake him up. He rebukes the wind and the waves. Says, oh, ye of little faith. Probably goes right back to bed. What is Peter doing when he's in jail? Not, not that Peter. The post acts. The post baptizing the Holy Spirit, Peter. What does he do? He's sleeping. Before the angel comes in, Peter was asleep. Not running around, not afraid. He started to take on the attributes of his master. He had quietness. He had rest. Even though he was in the midst of trauma, he had a peace about him even in the midst of a traumatic situation, sleeping. Imagine you're falsely accused, or you're accused of something that's ridiculous, but somebody's gonna, they're gonna execute you for that. And on the night before this happens, sleeping. That's what happens. That's what happened to Peter. After the spirit of truth became part of his life. And the last part about Peter, I said that was the last time before. You know, he was one of the lead, obviously one of the leaders of the, the church in Jerusalem. And people would come to the people who were members of that church. They would come in, those that had money, 
they would sell property, sell their items, and take the money, distribute it at the apostles' feet so that everybody's needs could be taken care of. So in ministry, in ministry, they had all the finances they need. And there was an issue with, you know, widows not being fed. You know, they didn't get the resources. Some widows felt like they were being excluded. Peter set up a commission along with the other apostles. And then those seven men ended up dealing with the situation so that they could make sure that everybody would get this money distributed as they needed it. So Peter, after the spirit of truth, became bold. Right? He became a conduit for miracles. He received miracles right, from God. He had all the finances that he needed, and he lived and operated in quietness and peace in the midst of a traumatic, a series of traumatic situations. Now let's talk about Judas. Now what I'm going to I'm going to say this first, and then we're going to talk about Judas. This is the Bible. This this message is for the body of Christ in America. The body of Christ in America. And I, I would argue to you that most of you, most of us are like Judas and not like Peter. Let's talk about Judas for a minute. Judas, you're not Judas in the classic sense because your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, so you are going to heaven. That's, that's a settled issue. We're not talking about that. But I'm talking about the day-to-day -day life. The day-to-day -day life how you live your life. Now, Judas was not in the room. He wasn't in the room. He was, they, he left. And we know that he made a deal at that point with the religious leaders to turn Jesus in, which happened later that night or early in the morning. So he already made a deal. Now, you know, I, I don't, nobody really knows his spe speculation as to why he did what his motivation was for purposes of what we're talking about. It really doesn't matter. But what happens, what happened to Judas when he did that. One of the things that happened is Judas is no longer a wanted man. Remember Peter ran away because they come after Jesus. They're all in trouble. Remember when he was looking at Jesus' trial from a distance, somebody said, hey, you were with him. No, no, no. Nobody's after Judas anymore. When you make a deal, if you're a, a, a believer, and you don't follow the word, and the word is not part of your life, you basically end up making a deal with the world because nobody's after him. He's not being chased anywhere. The Romans aren't looking for Judas because he publicly, they, don't, they didn't ask him what his private belief system was. He publicly made a break against Jesus both to the Romans as well as to the religious leaders. Nobody's after him. Remember when he was so upset about what happened? He went to the Pharisees. He went to the religious leaders. He said, Here, take the money back that you gave me to turn Jesus in. We don't want it anymore. This is terrible. This is blood money. And, and did they arrest him? Did they turn him over to the Romans? Did they accuse him of anything? No. They said, no, we don't want that money. That's on you. That's your problem. If you're guilty about it, that's, that's on you. Judas was found not guilty of being a Christian. Not guilty of being a follower of Jesus. And because of that, no matter what his inward conversion situation and story was, when you make, when you live your life without following the words of God and you do what everybody else does or you do what's acceptable, you, you just fit right in. Nobody's after you. Nobody's going to say anything about you because you're just like them. Girl walks by, hey, if you're a woman, some new guy in IT, hey, you know, if you're a boss, you want to sleep with somebody, go ahead. That's what they do. You want to go out and drink and get blasted Friday night? You want to smoke weed? You do that? You curse? Whatever it is they're doing, you're doing. And because of that, you are not guilty of being a Christian. You're going to have no problems with that. So, Many of us have made that inward commitment. Many of us have made that, have that conversion experience. But the challenge now is to live up to it and associate yourself with Christ, even in the out. I mean, I'm not talking about wearing a big t-shirt. I'm born again, walking around with a big 
sign about this and that. That's, that's not really the point. The point is, in your day-to-day -day life, do not deny Christ. In your day-to-day -day, day -day life, do not be afraid to be associated with the people of God. Because trauma, there's two kinds of trauma. Two kinds of trauma. There's a trauma that everybody goes through, COVID-19, worldwide pandemic. Everybody goes through trauma. We're all part of that trauma right now. Every nation, every color, every single person, every American has to deal with that trauma. But then there's also the trauma of what happens to you when you associate yourself with Christ in your daily life. That's what happened to Peter. When he started preaching and being associated with the name of Jesus, a man they had just executed, right? they didn't know he'd raised, risen from the dead. The disciples knew and a bunch of people knew. When that happened, they went after him. He was jailed, he was flogged, jailed again, put on death row. He was a marked man, right? But Jesus says, have peace. You will have peace. Because you adopted the spirit of truth, if you adopt the Holy Spirit, if you adopt the ways of the words of God, 14, 15, 16, 17, words of God, clothe yourself in the spirit of truth. It will show you things to come. You can overcome. Trauma associated with being a Christian and worldwide pandemic. If you're Peter, you're not going to need a bailout from the federal government. If you're Peter, you're not going to need unemployment benefits from this, any state that offers them. If you're Peter, you're not going to have to go to any food programs. Because like Noah, and like Joseph, and like Peter, when you follow the spirit of truth for your life, when you adopt the calling and the ways of God, he just kind of does things in such a way that so that he knows when these big things are coming. Who, I, didn't, I can't tell you any prophet who prophesied this worldwide pandemic happening like that. It just doesn't exist. But it, it really doesn't matter because if you're opting, operating like Peter, you'll always be fine. And so will your family and your ministry Whatever God has called you to, whether it's preaching or opening up a daycare center, or opening up whatever, your ministry will be protected. And you'll have all the finances that you need to move forward. Because you've already been walking with God. So, so that's, that's the message. Wrap yourself in the spirit of truth. He will show you things to come. Wrap yourself in the spirit of truth. He will show you things to come. And because of that, you'll be able to deal with not only the trauma associated with being a Christian, but also any worldwide or any kinds of crazy things that's, that's going on right now in the pandemic. That's it. So let's go to the altar call. Now, if you, if you are in the Judas camp, you're not a traitor. But if you were like that, as opposed to Peter, you have an opportunity right now to, to rededicate your life to Christ. Rededicate your, your life to Christ. You're already saved. We already know that. That's what I'm talking to. But we're talking about making a sea change. Living your life the way that it was intended to be lived according to the word of God. So Lord, just repeat, just repeat after me. Lord, Thank you, Lord, for my salvation. And thank you, Lord, for the church or ministry that I'm associated with. Lord, I repent of my old ways and my old mindset, and I adapt and adopt the word of God into my life. And I am no longer ashamed to be associated with Christ in public or in my private life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you heard the message. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to give you an opportunity now. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in him shall have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. All right, so in order for you to get saved, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus 
and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. With the heart, man believeth of the righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So today, just pray with me. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as, as Lord and Savior, pray with me now. Lord, I repent. I repent of my old lifestyle. And I accept you, Jesus, as Lord of my life. I declare and agree that you love me, that you came to die for me, and that on the third day you rose from the dead. So therefore, Lord, I declare that today that you are Lord of my life, and I will follow you for the balance of my life to the best of my ability. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, third altar call, if you accept that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, you've never been baptized, and you want to be baptized, we're still working on that. We're going to get it. You see the banner? We're, we're moving. We're moving. So if you want to be baptized, baptism is a commitment to Jesus. He that believeth is baptized shall be saved, or he that believeth not shall be damned. So you, you've already confessed Jesus. You want to take it a step further, agree to be water baptized the same way Jesus was when he started his ministry. Go online. You're already looking at it online. Send us an email, tell us you want to be baptized, and when the time is right, we'll make the proper arrangements. And finally, in terms of the spirit of truth, Peter was baptized in the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues in the, in the book of Acts, Acts 2. So we offer that to you today, to be baptized. You're already saved, you may have a church, may not have a church, but you've already accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But if you want to be imbued and empowered by the spirit of truth, just raise your hands and begin to praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name. Now speak. We're now baptized in the Holy Spirit. Speak with other tongues right now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Spirit, fall on these folks. Keep praising him. Amen. So, uh, again, we like to do a segment where I have to hear the words. Of, what do I do? What does God do? If, what do I do? What does God do? What do I do? What does God do? Well, if you're Peter, just continue to be an, a conduit to bless others. Continue to be a conduit to bless others. Don't hold it on to yourself. Don't get a big head because you made it through a pandemic. Some people got very wealthy in the pandemic, as you, as you know, very wealthy in the pandemic. So if you're in the body of Christ, if that's you and everybody's good, nobody died in your immediate family, you know, praise the Lord, but be, continue to be a conduit for others. For those who are like Judas, just two things. One, well, first I say God has already done. He's already, because he said those words to, to us, because he rose from the dead and because he's given us the spirit of truth, that's what God did. He gave us those words, he rose from the dead, and he sent the Holy Spirit as a, not as AI, but as somebody that we could have a connection to, that God could have a connection to us on the earth. And what we do, if you're Peter, continue to be a blessing, continue to be open, continue to give, don't let anything get to your head. Just don't do that. Just continue to be a conduit for God's blessing in terms of miracles, in terms of finances, in terms of courage, and in terms of peace. Now, for those in the body of Christ that are struggling, two messages. One, don't be stupid. 
I don't, I don't wear a mask. Get all the money that the federal government has to offer and all the money the state and local governments have to offer. Apply everywhere, right? If you're unemployed, get your unemployment. Continue to certify that you need those funds if you're not employed. And you're in a body of a crisis, you're laid off, or your job is eliminated, get that unemployment, right? And if you have some, unfortunately, some people have some food insecurity, apply for whatever you need to apply for and go wherever you need to go to make sure that you and your family have everything that you need. You know, this is the body of Christ. We're not all perfect here. It took Peter some time to get where he got. You saw how he was imperfect. And nobody's saying that anybody has to be perfect. If things didn't work out for you, get all the finances that you need to support your family, get all the food you need to, 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 to feed your family. And lastly, get back in the room. Get back in the room, listen to the words of Jesus. 14, 15, 16, 17. Listen to the words of Jesus. Meditate on it. Read it every day. Have your own little Bible study about it. Let that become part of your life. It may take some time. It took Peter maybe a couple of months. I don't know how long it's going to take you. It may take you two days. It may take you 20 years. But it really doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that you, that you make the commitment to do it. Make the commitment to do it. Come back in the room. Come back in the room where Jesus is telling you how much he loves you and what he could do for you and with you in the earth. Um, thank you very much. I'm Marlon Curtin. This is the Rockaway Cathedral. We're building God's kingdom in you. Uh, go in peace. Go in victory. In Jesus' name, amen.